everybody who's joining us. You are watching Ask an Expert, and whether you're watching the live stream or the recording, we're thrilled to have you here. My name is Amanda Rabluski. I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Boulder Community Health, and I coordinate what's called the PILLAR program. PILLAR exists to help folks navigate treatment and supports for addiction recovery, um, recovery for substance abuse treatment, and the management of chronic pain without the use of narcotics. Forgot to mention, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I apologize. I've been working on that. Um, <clears throat> but again, welcome. Um, as I mentioned, this series is called Ask an Expert, where we talk to experts in the field around substance use disorders, trauma, mental health, chronic pain, kind of all of the big questions that surround holistic health care. Um, that being said, tonight's discussion is not an easy answer to any of those issues. This is hopefully a message that can provide hope and potentially a step on a journey towards recovery or helping folks maintain long-term sustained recovery because it's certainly a continuum and it doesn't end when clinical treatment ends or when detox is over. So we're here to help um, navigate any of those big questions and hopefully get folks some right answers at the right time. So our discussion tonight is about nature and recovery and how the natural world can be a catalyst for healing. We are so thrilled to welcome back our speakers, David Ford, Brian Clink, and Jim Veraldi. They have been building a program with Pillar for the last three years that focuses primarily on recovery and wellness and exactly what we'll be discussing tonight, the natural world. So I will turn it over to them. They're going to talk about why nature is good for mental health and recovery and discuss some more details about the program. Um, throughout our stream tonight, please feel free to answer or to ask any questions in the chat and we'll try our best to get those answered. Um, and we'll just make it a discussion. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, enter your question or your thoughts in the chat box. And once we're finished, please, please, please consider filling out our post lecture survey. We wanna hear from you. So with that, I will turn it over to our speakers and they can take it away. Thank you. It's good to be back in such an amazing studio and what a um, really just welcoming at atmosphere um, just to kind of feel home, to be home, to be with you, Brian and Jim and Amanda, and really to welcome everybody from the audience and whoever will be viewing this video in the future um, to discuss a little bit about nature and the outdoors. Um, my name is David Ford. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the an education and outreach program manager with Open Space and Mountain Parks. And so you'll see a lot of us out in the, out in the system in different uniforms like this. I'm part of a community engagement team. We also have other uniform staff who are our rangers, our wildland firefighters, and lots of different roles. And we're always available out on the system to answer any questions that you may have or give you a really great hiking recommendation. Um, and, you know, a little bit about how you know, I got started with this, pro with this program, exploring a lot of the wellness and um, benefits of nature. Um, I used to be a subalpine guide and had always experienced some big outdoor adventures. And I really wanted to discover quite a bit of like, what is that awe inspiring, that magical feeling in the outdoors? And how can I access that without some big wild adventure? So we'll talk a little bit about that and the accessibility of awe um, during this program. Um, yeah, and also want to introduce some other amazing people here. I guess we can start with you, Brian. Yeah. Thank you, David, and thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm Brian Clink. I use he, him pronouns, and it's so good for us to be with you this evening, and thank you for joining us. I think what 
what attracted me to nature, I, I'm in long-term recovery myself, and um, it was a few years into my recovery that I discovered nature from from sort of a reciprocal reciprocal relationship standpoint rather than me out there running or using it for a workout was just the sort of the welcoming acceptance that I found there, which is a, a big piece of our program, right? We, we welcome everybody from all kinds of ability levels, experience levels, fitness levels. Anybody is welcome because that's how nature is, right? It's, it's welcoming for anybody. Anybody can be there. And so the welcoming nature of it, the, the, the deep acceptance I found there was unlike any other space that I've been in. And not only that, the, the wisdom, right? I feel like there's just this quiet wisdom that happens there. The network of not only trees and vegetation, but animals. They're, they're messengers. And I found that when I slow my pace enough to tune into them, a deeper kind of wisdom comes to me than sometimes is available in, in busy, busy life. Hi, my name is Jim Baraldi. Um, again, thanks to Amanda, David, and y'all for uh, having us again. Um, I'm also in long-term recovery. My pronouns are he, him. I think um, today I just had, just from nature to me, is a lot of kindness. And I was up on the trail today, and, um, you know, just to be a current experience, just to be around um, the wild turkeys that I saw, the deer that I saw, um, the birds that were just out and about. No one else was on the trail except me. So it was just really nice. It was just kind of a kind feeling. And um, also just gratitude about being in a place, as Brian said, about acceptance. And um, there's just a lot of compassion also in nature. Um, it's there. Nature's just there to have a relationship with us. And... Um, you know, if we're open to that and willing to venture in and give nature a chance, I think it's always open and willing to give us, give it, give to us its wisdom that it has. So, yeah, it's a great place to hang out, and it's been a really powerful tool in my recovery as well. So, thanks. Awesome. Well, to get started, I kind of... We wanted to have a little experience together to arrive. You know, we're watching this from behind a, behind a computer. We may not all be able to be together. Um, and, you know, when I think about an arrival to a trailhead, I don't think about being at the trailhead itself. That arrival can start with even just thinking about getting outside the door, about getting off that couch. And, you know, maybe tonight we can kind of take a little bit of a check-in with ourselves to really visit when we think about the outdoors, when we think about a forest, when we think about uh, some of the Great Plains, when we think about a mountaintop. When we think about this picture, what do we see? What do we feel? Do we feel a little bit closed in by a picture of, of woods? Do we feel curious? Do we want to look up? Do we want to investigate maybe the dark corners? Does it in kind of produce a calming feeling or does it in, in kind of produce a little bit more of hesitation? I don't know if I want to go there. No matter how we feel about the outdoors and what our experience is with either this photo alone or when we, th when we think about, about nature, that's okay. That's just simply part of our arrival. And um, what we're really excited to talk about tonight is just being able to acknowledge that feeling, being able to accept it, and being able to um, have some experiences outside of acceptance and belonging because as we're discussing when we think about the outdoors when we think about nature and when when, th when we think about being together and creating community and uh, and sense of self um, we all deserve to have those powerful awe-inspiring and wild experiences that enrich enrich our lives and and David if I could I mean when you said the word belonging that really I really felt something stir. I mean, one of the big things that we're about is community. Mm -hmm. um, 
about community and the outdoors and togetherness. And uh, many of us, you know, myself included in my struggles and the, the journey I've come through, find that the challenges, the struggles are, can be isolating, right? They can separate us, they can bring about this need or, or a compulsion to be alone, to hide, to have a secret. And I've found that some of the antidote to that is togetherness and belonging and support. Because what we're doing is difficult to do on our own. And so we are a welcoming community, uh, a supportive community, an inviting community for all, all types, for everyone. And I love the word belonging because I feel like I belong. I feel like we probably feel like we all belong. And so many of our participants tell us, wow, I, even though I just met you, I feel like I belong to this. And so that's such a, that's such a deep value, I think, that we hold in this. Brian, would you say that that's pretty common, that isolation, that secret for people? And it, Jim, too, certainly, if you wanted to speak to that, as you also um, mentioned, your recovery, are those a pretty like shared experience among people when they're active in their use or in those behaviors? I think so. I mean, I'd be mm -hmm. eager to hear what Jim has to say, but certainly there's this element, I think, that began often many of us come into this challenge having had years and years of experience practicing our compulsions. Mm -hmm. And and there was this need to start out in the younger years to, to have an escape, to have a, a way to cope that maybe wasn't approved, it wasn't looked at by caregivers <clears throat> or society as approved, and so we kept it secret. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a friend or two that shared it with us, but beyond that, we hid it. Mm -hmm. And that hiding continued then into adulthood and becomes a deeply rooted part of the compulsion. Mm -hmm. And so to help overcome that, all of us here, the three of us and Amanda, we just have this passion that that part of it is to get together. Part of it is to be together. Part of the answer is in togetherness and in community. Yeah, and I think also with um, addiction or any compulsive behavior, um, I think the big shame word comes into play and, um, you know, and there's been a lot of research done on shame and, you know, the antidote to shame is vulnerability and, you know, authenticity, which are big words to say, but are challenging words to practice. And um, I think also a word that came up, I think it's the antidote to some of those things, the fear is what David brought up a word earlier, curiosity. And I've found um, in my experience in recovery, if I can just start becoming a little bit more curious, a little bit at a time, because I was looking at that photo of around the corner, I was thinking, gee, I'm curious you know, what's around that corner more than what's dark and what's going to come at me, not less fear, but more curiosity. And I think as I've moved along in my recovery journey, I'm trying to practice that more a little bit at a time, the curiosity. And when my anxiety is up or my fear is up or my sadness is up, whatever, to kind of get a little bit more curious about, well, how come? And then maybe have a conversation with myself, with that feeling, hey, you know, what's going on? Let's have a little conversation. And you know, befriend that feeling, not say, get out, but say, well, what's happening? Be curious about it. Yeah. So, um, cause I think, yeah, addiction loves isolation and it loves shame. Uh, I mean, it doesn't like, um, connection or belonging, you know, it wants us to be alone and suffering. And I think, um, yeah, we need to connect to be, um, to recover and, uh, know that people care about us and love us and through connection that happens so mm -hmm. those were fantastic answers and when i heard you talk about curiosity and thinking about that photo the word that came into my head was bravery mm -hmm. yeah. and being brave and seeking that connection and kind of leaning more into that curiosity mm -hmm. yep. yeah thanks so much yeah mm -hmm. thank you guys yeah so at this point, we wanted to think just a little bit about, you know, we've kind of arrived to a trailhead. We've kind of, we're, we're arriving together. Or we've decided to take that brave step to head outside just to arrive at 
you know, a place that to us in the outdoors feels comfortable, feels safe, um, feels welcoming. And uh, we've kind of gotten off the couch and now we're there. Maybe we're in a city park. Maybe we've taken, um, you know, we've arrived at an open space mountain parks trail or we've gone for a little hike and now we're sitting in a wild space. So what's going on with the brain when we feel safe enough to really appreciate and to ground ourselves and to, um, to be a part and experience um, you know, d being connected to nature, not just going for a run, um, w running and walking over the trails and getting to that, um, you know, summit and coming back down, but the feeling of grounding and actually being a part of that journey itself. Well, in open space mountain parks, um, you know, we've been really taking a look at that into the nature experiences that we provide for people. Um, and, you know, over the last 10 years, especially, there's been an overwhelming amount of new research coming out, um, really allowing us from a science perspective to really explore what's happening within the human body from a physiological perspective, from a neurological perspective, what's happening in the brain. And we've been really starting to learn so much more more how, if we could sum it all up, nature can really help to be a catalyst, can be, um, can be an intervention that can allow the body kind of come back. It can help put us back um, and rebalance the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. Um, it can allow feelings of, uh, of, of, of increased happiness. Um, in open space mountain parks, we actually had a researcher do a, a study out on the trail just a, a few years ago um, about bird calls. They had some speakers along the side of the trail um, and they played it. Um, you know, sometimes they would have it off, sometimes they would have it on, and then they would survey hikers at the end of this little transect. Um, and hikers that experienced the bird calls reported an elevated sense of happiness, mm -hmm. an elevated sense of well-being. Yeah, and I sense. love that, the communication of a forest, the communication of nature, and all of the beings, just hearing that, just sensing that, um, has positive health out outcomes for ourselves. Um, you know, th there's been research done in Japan and other countries where literally at a ranger station or at a trailhead, people will put their arm into a blood pressure cuff. They'll go out for the, uh, the hike and then they'll come back and have another reading. <laughs> um, and the results have shown a decrease in blood pressure. Um, there's all these different studies that have come out of uh, that um, that nature can really help and ha help us um, come into our bodies and provide different benefits for that increased sense of well-being. Um, I really love, you know, there's different books that I've been reading, Your Brain on Nature. Um, Florence Williams, who, you know, as a former Boulder resident here, um, who wrote The Nature Fix. And what is really provocative and interesting, Florence really Williams describes that right now in human history, we're in one of the largest migrations that our species has ever faced. And that migration is indoors, in front of screens, mm -hmm. and essentially away from and outside, for a lack of better word, outside of the environment that our very species evolved to be in. And in Western society, that is ever more more um, present. And so when I think about, um, I think when I'm indoors, I am outside of a place that my body, my, my, my human being was meant to be. And I really like investigating that concept because it can also bring some thoughts to myself that when I go outside, maybe that's when I'm going home. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the that's a place that if I don't have the right amount of um, exposure to the natural world and exposure to nature, then maybe I might be uh, have some some health impacts. Maybe I'm not reining the the full the full impact. Um, 
another thing to mention is in response to to pain, in response to um, to some maybe negative emotions. Um, in the book, Your Brain on Nature, they also go over there as this one study that found that when the alpha waves are really firing in your brain, when you experience that feeling of awe and wonder in the outdoors, um, that can have a very similar um, uh, impact that some pain medications have, but without the reduced side, the, the side effect of reduced cognitive function, but has a side effect of increased cognitive function. Mm. And the research keeps on going on and we'll be discovering some more and more just fascinating parts about what it is to bring us back back into nature mm -hmm. and uh, back to a place um, of true belonging and of, of uh, um, as we experience more and more health and safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love the book, the, the Nature Fix. And as I read it and I experience the science behind this, and it's not just, even though the experience is, is profound and important, science backs it up. And I, and I really appreciate that. And I can also say that personally, in my own personal experience, as I oftentimes with Jim, we, we finish our program, we walk back to our vehicle and we drive back to our, my place together. I feel just this deep sense of, of peace, this deep sense of connection, not only to other people, but to myself and to spirituality. Um, there's a spiritual component of being outside that is sometimes beyond words. And so I can personally back up that science by just noting how I feel inside. Mm -hmm. right? I feel calm. I feel ease. I feel joy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I come into these programs as one of the leaders of them, feeling a little nervous and feeling, how are people, are people going to like this? I really want people to, to love this, and I'm a little anxious about that. But when I leave... I'm a, I'm a different person. Mm -hmm. I'm in a different state. So I, I really can, I can just give personal testimony that that science is accurate. And I think also just a sense of a service, you know, coming from a 12 step world, um, you know, uh, the 12 steps giving back, you know, to others. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give our experience, strength and hope back to, other folks that come and like echo what Brian was saying, yeah, when we leave, um, yeah, we do feel good. But if it's just, for me, it's a sense of service. I've given back. And um, I think people appreciate, they appreciate it when we're there. They list the comments that we receive when we're up on the trail. Thanks so much for being here. I can't, couldn't wait to do this again. And so I think it's a lot of service. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about being peer leaders in a program like this. Um, I know both of you, both Brian and Jim, are certified peer recovery coaches or peer specialists. Mm -hmm. Can you guys talk a little about just what that means and how that um, has impacted the work with this program and just other work that you do with folks that are on their own recovery journeys? I think for me, it just puts, we're on this, it's on the same level. Um, I'm, a, I'm someone that, you know, as a recovering addict and recovering from, you know, obsessive compulsive behavior. And I think <clears throat> someone that's also in that same space, you know, we're not, we're not in, out in the trail, we're not in, be in these four walls where it's kind of a, a contained environment. We're out in the open, we're out in nature. And I think it makes us feel like we're all, we're together. There's not like, oh, I'm the peer, so I should know all this. No, I'm the same as you. I wrestle with the same things you wrestle with every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I might have a little bit more, maybe I have a couple more tools in my tool bag at this point, but, you know, you can always get those tools as well. So I think for me, it's about just being side by side with someone and just having a, a conversation, you know. And to peer means um, I'm your friend. I'm willing to listen and be here, be of service, you know, to you in this journey and in, in that moment that we're at right at the, you know, up on the trail. Yeah. I love what you say, Jim, about beyond the four walls of like an office, right? A therapeutic setting, which is, which is important, but, but not all of us connect deeply within those four walls. There can be challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And, 
sitting across from somebody and staring them into the eyes and answering questions that being outside, being open, mm -hmm. being just, just immersed, being <clears throat> in nature and as nature is, is a lot different experience. It mm -hmm. can be much more welcoming, much less intimidating. And, and as peers, as Jim mentioned, there's, there's no hierarchy there, right? Mm -hmm. We're it's, everybody is on equal footing. Yeah. And as peers, we understand, we understand the steps that you're taking. We understand a, a bit about the journey that you're on and there's never any questioning or criticism or judgment for anything that comes up because, you know, we, we're there, we've been there. We're, we're, we're not perfect. We don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. We're still figuring out this journey together. Mm -hmm. Um, but the beauty about being, of being peers together in this is that we're there with you. Mm -hmm. We're there with you. We're there together. You know, there's, I have a wonderful wife. She's, she's amazing in so many ways, but she doesn't struggle with addiction or compulsion. And so she doesn't quite have that understanding that we all do that, that you do of what that's like. And so there's something that's really special that happens when we come together to share in that, to share the struggles, and sometimes even share the tears, and to have someone there to witness you, to be with you in the midst of that. It, it's a really special relationship we have together as peers. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think as a, as a peer, I know with my wife and I, we go out and we go for walks, try and go for a walk, you know, every day. But there's something about in nature or being outside when you're having this side-to-side -side conversation mm -hmm. and walking and talking that just kind of stimulates conversation. And it's just different than, you know, I mean, we do have face-to-face -face conversations as well, but there's something kind of stimulating about just walking and talking. And I, you know, experience that with the guys I work with, you know, when we go on hikes in the morning, there's just so much good conversation, but it's two peers, two people in the same boat sharing their experience, strength and hope with one another. And I think that's kind of the, mm -hmm. a big, um, powerful piece of peer, peer support. Agreed. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Uh, the conversation even of just walking beside somebody and being out on the trail. I'm also kind of remember remembering some other research that I read of, you know, uneven surfaces that we walk over on mm. the trails is really kind of that, if I haven't mentioned it before, that bilateral stimulation in the brain and being mm -hmm. able to be there with somebody who sees you, yeah. to be able to process memory and positively, yeah. um, you know, witness those experiences and process mm -hmm. emotion. I mean, what a fantastic place to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so what does all this look like in practice? We've spoken a little bit about the feelings and some of the research. Um, you know, some of the other research that when I first started looking into what exactly is happening in the brain, how is this happening, I started to think about, well, there's many components of nature. There are streams, scenic viewpoints, shade, places that maybe we can like kind of have a rock that feels just right against our back, maybe a place of um, where we feel like we can hide a little bit. Maybe there's all these components and we can, um, within a nature experience, we can um, start uh, creating whatever experience we want to get. You know, some of the, the research that I, you know, even 15 some years ago that I started reach actually was coming from architecture and the design of shopping spaces and uh, what a lot of people call biophilic design of how do we bring the nature into indoor spaces. And I started to, to figure out, um, like, why do they put water fountains? Why do they put, you know, water features in malls? And even just the sound of water being able to, mm -hmm. to lower blood pressure, it, it keeps you there. Mm -hmm. It keeps you there. And it maybe you can help to make a certain decision that mm -hmm. you're about to make. You know, the scenic viewpoints, being able to, to think about future decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the very means of walking on an even, even terrain like we discussed. Um, there's also this, this element that we're overcoming perceived risk, mm -hmm. um, that, we're, that we're pushing ourselves 
and we're also playing with an experience so we can we can um, maybe push ourselves um, to a, a level that feels comfortable um, and we have complete say in our experiences. Um, I also think about the elements in the outdoors of mindfulness. Sometimes in, in the programs, you all incorporate quite a bit of art, expression, mm -hmm. um, and really starting to investigate what is it about this human wild relationship where all beings are out there together. I really love that that concept. Um, and in conversations with you all as well, you know, it's been really fun to think about just like any mental health or recovery journey. It's so simpler, similar to these mountain trails and boulders. They have peaks and valleys and, you mm. know, to, like events and other things that happen along the way that may be a curveball and, you know, all types of things can happen. And it's so, so it's such a great reminder about all experiences in life and especially when we relate it to mental health, to recovery, um, just how those messages in the outdoors are so prevalent. Um, and that's just been really fun to both study, to look at, and just have these conversations with you all as we're always trying to involve, um, evolve how we, how we progress, you know, the recovery series, our program that we've built together and, um, and deepen our own personal relationships with the outdoors. Yeah. I think, um, in my experience, one of the biggest, big outcomes that, uh, that I've seen, I think we've all seen, is when we head out to the um, Lightroot Farm. And um, I just think the people being able to, um, the outcome, I mean, people interacting with pigs, with horses, with the compost pile, which is black gold. You'd have to come out to the farm to see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I just see there's just so many metaphors out there, and I see a lot of people walking away from the farm experience as they really touched because yeah. they got to milk mm -hmm. a cow, they got to pet a pig, they got kids come sometimes, and they get to get chicken eggs, and or even the adults, you know. And it's um, the farms, oh, it's a special place, and um, yeah, Cameron and Daphne do such a good job, you know, helping giving us a tour of it. The farm, I always appreciate going to the farm. I appreciate all of our adventures, but um, the mm -hmm. farm is, farm's fun. Yeah. Well, and I think that speaks to the community piece that you guys mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, being connected to something bigger and seeing yeah. those cycles through. And even, yeah, that compost is a nasty, yucky, rotting pile, you mm -hmm. know, for a lot of its life cycle, but then it turns into this amazing black gold, like black you gold, mentioned, yeah. and that is a really fantastic metaphor, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this might be one of those moments where, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more. What are the other experiences that you all provide, um, you know, that we've been providing to, to folks in the, in the series? And um, maybe just briefly kind of mm -hmm. explain kind of those elements and maybe a moment of how, you know, people can replicate that on their own as they're see whether they come out, uh, you know, with you all, with us on this program, or like what are some things based on what the programs that you all provide that people can maybe seek out on their own? Yeah, that's a, that's great. I'm glad that we're talking about this because what we offer is so so exciting. You know, what what comes up for me as you as you ask the question, you know, the offerings that we have, you know, the, the watching the sunset together. Mm -hmm you know, from Flagstaff Mountain is always such a, a, a serene experience. It's, it's a beautiful experience. Um, so that one comes to mind for sure. I think for me, when I, when I talked about coming away from the program, just feeling calmed and ease and connected, it often happens in our, our mindfulness our mindfulness in nature event that we do. It's kind of like forest bathing. If you've heard of forest bathing before, um, just what kind is of forest bathing. If you haven't heard of it before. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I can take a stab at it <laughs> Yeah, and Hang you can correct forest. me when I get it wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? But it's, it is like bathing, right? It's like immersing yeah. in the, in the inviting waters of nature. I, I don't, I don't know how to explain it better than that. It's a, uh, it's an immersing and a, and a quieting and a slowing down 
in the in the warm inviting waters that are there mm -hmm. and we provide an experience like that and it's a very safe it's a very welcoming experience you know we will get we get a few emails people asking what will, will what will be expected of me will there be you know um well, I need to do things. Well, I have to share things about myself. And just we just want you to know that it is there's there's no requirements. There are no expectations. Well, and there's one it is, requirement. And that and that is you have to be clear headed. You, you have, have to, to be clear headed. Clear -headed. Yes. Well, yeah. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> just want to make that clear. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of sharing of yourself or, you know, explaining where you are on your journey, there's no there's there's no pressure to do any of that. And I'm thinking of one particular young man that was in a program recently who had a, a quite a deep uh, sort of an inner child, if you will, inner child experience. I think there was a mm -hmm. connection there that he had to um, hit the younger, his younger self in nature. And it was a, a very beautiful, a very a welcomed experience that he had. Um, and it was it seemed to be really poignant and pivotal in his journey in once again, reconnecting with the younger parts of himself, reconnecting with some of the needs that were there. It was an emotional time for him. Um, and so it brought such satisfaction for me to see the safe container that was available to him mm -hmm. to be able to go there. It was, it was particularly impactful for me. Mm -hmm. I like um, just... We did we do art activities sometimes and a number I don't know when it was a little bit a couple of events ago but uh, we would have everyone come and start off with a piece of paper and then they had one minute to draw something on the on the paper and then they had pass it to the right and then someone else would draw and he'd keep going around until I got back to the person to see what's on your paper the picture then you could label or name it do whatever you wanted to do and then we would talk about it afterwards like what do you see in this photo and i i enjoyed that because again i think it just brought it it invited people to take a risk and to draw something and to go around and then also just invited them to talk about what it was but then there's just all this laughter going on and people just sharing and it's so it things lighten up and it's just um so I think that's what also happens a lot as we're out on the trail or doing activities is people just, they feel safe and they feel comfortable and they lighten up and they're saying, this is a cool place to be and I'm just going to enjoy myself. And um, so I've seen that a lot on our, on our adventures out there. Mm -hmm. People just really, they like it. They like, gosh, I wish I'd do this more often just to be out in nature it's like, I don't do it enough, you know, I'm glad I'm out here, you know, I'm like, when's the next one? Just because, as Brian said, it's very, we don't, you're not expected to do anything, just show up and do what you can, and um, we do our best to accommodate people from sometimes getting them a um, a bike for, if you have a, that um, David provided for um, the accessibility bike? Yeah, we sometimes provide if we have good notice in advance a hand cycle yeah, for certain right. trails that we go on and mm -hmm. you know and we're always you know through conversation through preparation we're, mm -hmm. we're always available to kind of meet accommodations as we as yeah. we need it yeah it's pretty fun to hear i mean you know we offer these sunset kind of community events of just being there together through learning techniques to practice mindfulness out in the forest or mm -hmm. go together to a farm to think a little bit about more of healthy intakes in our body, right? Mm -hmm. About, you know, thinking about our food as medicine, thinking about just, you know, being present with a cow and a pig or chickens mm -hmm. and other things and thinking about those lessons from life cycles. Um, you know, and we also usually provide a naturalist on these programs mm -hmm. too, available for kind of questions about what we're seeing in the outdoors and being there with everybody to kind of also kind of be kind of this little, this bridge to connection. You know, what bird call am I hearing? What plant am I seeing? And learning more and more about the other beings that are outside when we see nature, 
I kind of like the fact that when I see nature, I can see a little bit more of myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you all are really providing a lot of those experiences. I think a little bit about, you know, and somebody who's really been um, delivering some of these mindfulness and nature programs for, for years, there is this one time, you know, I was working with a group of cancer survivors and, you know, I, I, there was this one person on the program and we were kind of going over a little bit of mindfulness about what are, what is something that we might walk over every day, all the time that now we can maybe notice to see and pull mm -hmm. out a deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. individual, we just sat in, you know, early, early spring, sat in the grass, which, you know, had kind of looks like it's kind of, you know, it's crispy, it's dead, and was just sitting there. And, you know, a bug was crawling by and um, started to, you know, wipe away some of the dead grass and noticed a little bit of, you know, some new green grass coming up. And they debriefed and they were, t they were telling the group later on that it was the first time since a cancer diagnosis. The cancer diagnosis made them feel as if they were the dead grass. Mm -hmm. And they were sitting there, they're kind of just having a mindful moment of just really just being present. And they saw this little green blade of grass and they said it was the first time since their diagnosis that they felt like they were that little piece of, of grass that was mm -hmm. poking up through. And I love those moments. They come from feeling safe enough, from feeling present enough, from being in your body enough to be able to pull out a deeper meaning from something so small and seemingly insignificant. <clears throat> Those moments are so healing. They're so valuable to our lives. And being able to slow down in the outdoors is something pretty profound. Um, that moment will stick with me for the rest of my life mm -hmm. um, in w being able to bear witness to somebody being there. And I learn from that. Every time I witness one of those experiences, having my own in the outdoors is something incredibly enriching from both a practitioner, from somebody who facilitates experiences, um, but also just to simply share in that experience mm -hmm. and community. Um, and I, I, I love it. It's the best part of my job mm -hmm. yeah. to witness people, mm -hmm. not just to share an experience, but to witness mm -hmm. others in their own relationship with the natural world. Um, yeah. that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. For sure. Yeah. So I guess this would be a good time. So how do we get started? Um, you know, I, we've all been there where we're sitting on the couch, our a daily routine, you know, might be watching TV, might be just grocery shopping on a day off, all these things, you know, that's a human experience. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for, for me as somebody who's had my entire professional career, you know, over the last 20 years of being working in the outdoors, facilitating experiences, there are plenty of days that, you know, that I struggle to even get to the trailhead. Mm -hmm. That I, you know, might just be feeling burnt out, that I feel maybe alone, that mm -hmm. I'm just feeling like I can't get there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how can we start small? What are some of the first steps that we can take? You know, I know we have the program, but arriving to a trailhead to go on a program, that can be a tough first step. So how do we start smaller, like the, the, the realistic things that we can do to maybe eventually get to the program, maybe eventually venture off on our, on our own to have, you know, these self-supportive experiences of building in positive habits. What do you all think? I think, um, <clears throat> because of my mind, if you live in a Boulder area or just this area in general, um, just walking out your front door and uh, walking around the block if that's all you, if you haven't done much you know it's like anything you got to start off small and like in the movie what about bob you know you got to take baby steps so um i think just walking out your front door and um going for a walk with a significant other or yourself and um and starting off there and then when you feel pretty good about that i mean if you haven't been on a trail then there's plenty of trails in this area where you can start off slow and easy and work your way up so i think 
that's my suggestion. If it's have a, just go out the front door to begin with. You know, and yeah, agreed. And and what comes to me too, in addition to what Jim is saying, is oftentimes when we're when we're working with somebody who is and I'm, I'm speaking of in my practice, in my experience, working with somebody that's kind of having trouble, like being present to, to what's happening in the body, to what we're feeling, to what's anything other than thinking is we'll offer the invitation of taking the good Mm. as you begin to explore this very gently, very slowly to savor the world. What what are the things that you're noticing that bring a sense of pleasantness Mm. that are, enjoyable and to savor them and so i would add on to what jim is sharing as you're outside walking around the block or maybe your backyard noticing the flowers noticing the grass maybe the bees the the insects is to take in the good allow yourself to pause enough to see how where there echoes of that are you noticing echoes of that in you anywhere so the sense of savoring and almost like I'm, I'm holding this microphone like it's an ice cream cone, right? I'm like <laughs> feeling like I want ice cream. And when I eat ice cream, because food can be part of my compulsion, I'm learning to savor it, right? I'm learning to slow down and just really enjoy the experience mm-hmm. so that that can fill me and satisfy me. And I think that is at least for me has been a first step in nature is to take the small step out my front door and really savor the deliciousness of the experience that I'm having. Cool. Echo that. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. I was having some uh, conversation with some healthcare professionals as well. And, you know, even just taking 30 minutes a day to step out your door Mm -hmm. and to, you know, just allow yourself to experience the wind over your skin, some sunlight, mm-hmm. 30 minutes a day of, you know, it's, it's not a lot, but that can have some profound positive impacts on your health. Um, you know, and uh, I also think as far as some, some, some first steps, if you ever are struggling to find a trailhead, um, want some recommendations based on what you want, your experience, us, we're at Open Space Mount Parks, we're here for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a whole outreach team that is dedicated towards crafting these outdoor experiences mm-hmm. to your ability and comfort level. They're staffing the Chautauqua Ranger, Ranger Cottage at 900 Baseline. They are there every day during business hours to help craft an experience. They're great to talk to. Um, some of the first steps sometimes I encourage people is just get to a trailhead. Maybe your objective that day is to arrive at a trailhead, see how it feels. Maybe there you take your 30 minutes. Maybe you just walk a little bit to a place that feels comfortable. Maybe you go out and have some big, epic outdoor experience, There, but it's there. Mm-hmm. And you're there, and you showed up for yourself. You showed up for the outdoors, mm-hmm. um, and you showed up for your community because you are taking care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, We've been talking a a bit about the recovery and wellness series that we provide, and maybe that is something that you come along and participate. Um, The recovery and wellness series, we generally post um, well in advance. People can find all of those those programs at naturehikes.org, along with all types of other uh, enriching Um, tailored programming from Open Space and Mountain Park staff. But the Recovery and Wellness Series is our partnership with Boulder Community Health and with Jim and Brian. Yeah. Um, And, um, yeah, there's there's quite quite a few things that I think are, you know, that people can always do and, you know, people can really reach out with any, Mm -hmm. without without any, with any questions. Um, Yeah. Speaking of, yes, <laughs> we've got about 10 more minutes Great. in the hour. Um, so I want to give folks in the audience a chance to throw any questions or thoughts you might have in the chat. In the meantime, if we could pull up that resource slide, because that will have my contact info as well as how to access the um, 
the recovery and wellness series, the, a couple links to that. Um, I just pulled it up. Great. It's there yeah. on, up on, on screen. Yeah. And on my website there, livingcolorhealing.com, there is a page that has all of our events for the, for the rest of the year, all on one page. So if you like Perfect. just want a quick snapshot of what we're offering from now and through the end of the year, it's right there on my site. Good. And that should come up on the screen in just a second. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, but in the meantime, that was all fascinating. And mm -hmm. yeah, I've been a part of helping to build this program for what it's been now about three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? We're celebrating this is 2023 has been year three, um, you know, beginning as something during COVID to get people outside to downregulate those nervous systems. Um, and certainly always with the focus on recovery. Mm -hmm. So I'm incredibly grateful for all three of you, for all the work that you have put in, that you continue to do. Um, we're not getting any questions currently, but we'll still give it a few more minutes. And okay, there's that resource slide. And we space these programs out throughout the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have kind of a quarterly uh, timetable that we do, but they're spaced out to, to offer a a, a, a mild winter experience, a spring, a summer, a fall uh, experience. And so uh, this is an ongoing, uh, you know, as we've mentioned a couple of times, we commonly get the question, when's the next program? Mm -hmm. And so we are adding programs. We're adding new kind of uh, fun ideas. We have a program coming up in a couple of weeks, which is summer camp day, mm -hmm. where we will have outside community-oriented games and fun uh, because fun is a part of recovery as well enjoying smiling laughter uh, getting through a challenge as a team f solving a problem will be part of summer camp day <laughs> so we're adding uh, new things new challenges fun exciting adventures uh, to the program continuously yeah absolutely and yep we are working to add some more days next year um well, I think with that, was there any other final thoughts any I of you might have? I just want to hear, there's a quote, Brian, that you say every, every once in a while that you did at the end of our four-minute video. I think it was an Emerson quote. Do you remember that one? I'm, it's, can you give me a hint? Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing can, I think it was challenge us in life that nature, nothing can befall us in life. Ah, Yes. I can't, it's not coming to me, but you have I think it. it was, yeah. I think it so was. Go, so go ahead. I think it was nothing can befall us in life that nature, nature can. cannot repair. Yes. I love that. Mm -hmm. I yes. love the idea that we are always welcome home. Yeah. And our home can, you know, can be outside. And there's plenty of us in the community that are helped to get us there. Mm -hmm. I love that message, and I really appreciate both you and Amanda. And as we continue to explore the benefits and that, you know, equitably accessible yeah. public lands has on public health. Yeah, I love to that. We'll continue to explore that. And let me share my gratitude as well for you all and for Boulder Community Health and the Pillar Program mm -hmm. for making this possible. It's a just a, a really special partnership that we have with, with Boulder Community Health and with the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks. Mm -hmm. And we're incredibly fortunate to have this level of support mm -hmm. for our wellness. Yeah. Uh, it is such a gift. So we look forward to seeing you. We, we want to welcome you. Uh, you're getting a chance to know us. We want to get to know you. So please come and join us. We would love that. Yeah, grateful for the program, and it's been a great experience. I was just going to come in and oh, say come a few on final things. Come behind okay. us. Like come a, in. Like a family portrait. Yeah. And we could have a, Are we still kind on? Of a moment of a yeah, family no, picture type of uh, thing. Do you want to? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, sorry, I'll just finish. Yeah. You guys, it's really been a fun experience being a part of this. So, um, yeah, please join us. I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers here tonight, to Open Space, 
our facilitators, the city of Boulder, Stone Cottage Studios, we are incredibly grateful. None of this exists in a vacuum. None of this can be done without us working together. And we want you all to be a part of our community as well. So thank you so much to everyone who's joined us today. Again, everyone we've shouted out, BCH Marketing, um, the hospital <laughs> itself, and everyone that's been a part of this this year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Good stuff.